So I learned to be very self-sufficient from an early age, and I've always questioned authority. I've always sought the truth, and I cannot ignore you know, inconvenient truths. So my red pill moment absolutely was, well, there isn't a respiratory pandemic going on because less respiratory deaths are happening than normal. Something else is going on, but I don't know what it is. So I, I gradually, you know, it's a bit like an onion, you know, you peel a layer off and then there's more layers and there's more layers and you keep going. And I'm still doing that now, sort of, you know, we're nearly four years in now and I'm still peeling layers off. And at some point you have to say, well, I've I've seen enough, I don't want to go any further because it doesn't yeah. matter how many layers there are, you know, but you know, what we were told, what isn't true. My quest now is to pursue the truth and to, I mean, I'm working in, in an area of, of what I would call true holistic healthcare. So I'm trying to bring the truth to healthcare in a way that it's been denied to most people around the world for a long time. Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring. Today, it's my pleasure to be joined by Graham Atkinson, the red pill pharmacist. And, um, He's going to share his insights on what he's learnt about the corrupting influence of the pharmaceutical industry on healthcare. He, he has a very interesting story as a pharmacist in quite a senior leadership position uh, inside the NHS, which is the public health system in the UK. Um, he was exited for speaking out against um, uh, COVID policies and has since learnt a lot about um, the influence of pharmaceutical industry on medical practice, and I'm just delighted to have him here so he can share his story. Graham, welcome. And uh, I think a great place to start really is, you know, just t tell us your story. What 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 happened that, uh, that, that someone who was kind of well situated within, you know, regulatory medicine and a pretty decent role after 20 years suddenly had everything, everything kind of change and, and their eyes open? Yeah, it's um, good question. So, thank you for the invitation to to speak with with you and your audience. Um, so, my I'm I'm a, I qualified as a pharmacist in the UK back in the late eighties. So, I've I've had a over thirty year career as a pharmacist. Um, initially, that was in high street pharmacy, you know, filling prescriptions. Um, did that for about sixteen years. Did mainly down the management route. I was a senior manager in a large um, corporate. In the, in the UK, a large pharmacy corporate. And in the, in 2002, I joined the English NHS as, um, the role was called a director of commissioning. So my role would be to purchase <clears throat> and performance manage the all, all services. So that's hospital services, general practice services, mental health services, ambulances, you know, paramedics, the whole, the whole gamut, the whole range of services. And I would also work closely with public health colleagues. Um, so my role was to interpret government policy and then make local decisions, regional decisions, if you like, typically on a population of about 350 to 500,000 patients. Mm -hmm. So my role would be to um, take government direction, receive national funding, and then spend that money in a way that would um, best you know, meet the, the, the national policies, if you like. So for many years, I was the system guy. I was the archetypal system guy. Um, I really believed in medicine in, in both senses, both in, you know, the, the allopathic healthcare system and also drugs. Um, I thought drugs were necessary for some people. Um, but I always had a very keen interest in prevention and more of the sort of public health side and the, the more population based approaches. So I would, I'd be very keen to spend money, public money to prevent diseases in the first place. So I'd be um, quite often seeking to take money away from hospital services in order to move services into the community or even pay for primary prevention work, work with schools or work with disadvantaged communities, that sort of thing. So I, that was part of my role. I also had a, um, as part of my role, because I was a pharmacist, I chaired what we call drug formulary committees. So I would chair a panel of doctors and pharmacists looking at new drugs coming into the market. We'd look at the clinical trial evidence. We'd discuss the data, the effectiveness, the, the harms, possible, you know, side effects, the cost of the drugs. And we'd then decide whether those drugs could be used, whether, you know, whether they'd be added to the formulary that doctors could actually prescribe from. So I chair those committees as well. Um, I spent a three years out of the NHS working directly with the pharmaceutical industry. So I, I 
In 2013, I took a private consulting role and I worked with most, if not all, of the pharmaceutical companies in the UK, helping them sell their drugs back into the NHS. So working directly with the marketing teams, um, you know, and occasionally coming across their, their, their medical teams and their safety teams. Went back to the NHS in um, 2016, uh, worked at a regional level again, or in between, I'd had a national role. I worked at sort of sub-government, sub, just sub-national role um, for two years, um, 2010 to 2013, um, uh, implementing policy at a national level. Then went back to regional level at 2016. Um, and then in 2019, I took a role with a general practice on the front line. So this is a, a GP practice about 25 doctors in the practice and I became a partner. I, I invested in the business. So I was, I owned the business together with 15 doctors, 15 general mm-hmm. practitioners. So that was in 2019 and then 2020 came and we rolled into the COVID era. Um, and I was initially very scared. I was a, I was, I was actually trained as what we call a gold commander. So when the 100-year pandemic arrives, I'd be one of the bureaucrats, if you like, that goes in the bunker along with the army and the police and the government officials and the secret service. I'd be the NHS person in the bunker running things um, when the when the country's, you know, in a 100-year pandemic. So I initially, you know, bought the COVID narrative. I uh, was very scared, considered I might die. We predicted we would probably lose five or six of our doctors, probably about 500 patients would die. And after four weeks, none of that happened. And Mm -hmm. lots of people had supposedly caught COVID in our care homes. We had lots of very elderly patients admitted to hospital in their 80s and 90s, then discharged a week later perfectly well. And I started questioning what we were being told by our government, essentially. And it didn't take very long to sh- for me to realize that we were being sold a lie and that the, we weren't in the middle of a respiratory 100-year um, pandemic and something else was going on. And so I set about trying to help the people around me see what was actually going on because what I'd noticed were that patients were being harmed. These, And I'm not talking about p- patients with COVID or identified as COVID. I'm talking about mental health patients cancer patients, people with heart disease, um, that they were being denied services because we would we'd shut down the NHS. We'd lock down our local services and waiting times, access all, all got thrown to the wind and people were dying. I, you know, my, my patients in my practice, I, I saw more deaths from people being denied care than people who supposedly were um, caught up in the pandemic. So I was speaking out. I was trying to get my GPs to uh, see this. And one-to-one in conversations quietly, several of them agreed with me. Mm-hmm. But in a group, when there, were, when there was 15 of them together in the partnership meetings, they would not agree with me. And the ones that had agreed with me would vote against me. So 2020 progressed and I got, I tried to stop lockdown too happening here in the UK in our practice. I didn't want to shut down the practice again because I knew it was going to harm patients. I failed. Um, we were offered the opportunity to open a COVID vaccine center, which I didn't want to do. I voted against it, but I was outvoted by my GP. So I had to open a COVID vaccine center in late 2020. And for basically the next eight, nine months, we were running a non-stop COVID vaccination service as well as a general practice. So none of this sat comfortably with me at all. Um, I'll, I'll declare that I'm unvaccinated to this day. I don't mm-hmm. believe in the, the technology when it was first explained to me in terms of we're going to change your genetic um, you know, material to express the most um, pathogenic part of a virus. That made no sense to me at all, you know, from a sort of, pharmaceutical point of view and the, the the fact that these are untested emergency authorized products you know didn't sit well with me at all so i spent most of 2021 trying to um survive because i was being asked to be ex- to, to you know be quiet i i'd been told to stop talking about things and uh it became very difficult and eventually uh the disagreements in the partnership um, got to a position of where my partners 
essentially voted me out. And I said, don't worry, um, I'm going. So in mm-hmm. October 21, I walked away from a 32-year pharmaceutical career uh, in the NHS, and I've not worked since in the system. Yeah. So I guess, um, you know, one of the things that I really love about your uh, blogs is you have all of these analogies to The Matrix, which is a movie I absolutely love. And um, Graham is an excellent writer. If you're listening to this and you enjoy it, I'd say really check out his blog. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to use a matrix language. Mm. I mean, when, when all of this happened to you, was this your red pill moment? You know, when, when everything was happening with COVID, you were getting ostracized by your peers. You were seeing, I guess, the group think, you know, people agreeing with you in private, but they're not wanting to go against the narrative in a group. Was, was, that, was that the red pill moment for you where you, you started yeah. to see things differently? It, it was. Um, so that I'd, I'd had several sort of near red pill moments in my career earlier. Oh, wait, think, let's just, just for the people who haven't seen The Matrix, could you yeah. explain what the red pill yeah. moment is just to give context? Yeah. Yeah. So the, so in The Matrix, I mean, I've, uh, I actually, that movie probably saved my life because I, yeah. if you haven't seen it, it you know, we, we um, please watch it. it. I mean, I probably watched it about 50 times in 2020 because I identified absolutely with the, with the story, which is that the the main character is living in an, a dream world, if you like, an unreality, and that uh, at some point he is woken up and quite quite painfully, forcefully, is confronted with the real world. Um, and I, I I came to see my NHS role and what was happening in wider society, not just the NHS and the healthcare system. I came to see that as the matrix. And in fact, I referred to it. I had a, a very, I still got a very good friend. I used to go out running at lunchtime and I say, I used to go run with him and say, look, I've dialed out the matrix. Let's go for a run. And then we go for a run and then say, right, I need to dial back in now, yeah. which is in the movie if you haven't seen it. So yes, yeah, so I'd, I'd had, um, I'd, you know, working as a pharmacist with the pharmaceutical industry, I would probably had a, a rude awakening probably about 2013 that the pharmaceutical industry is a business. It's a business about selling products to ill people. And therefore, it makes no sense to reduce your customer base by curing people. And, you know, at at the very least, you know, the pharmaceutical industry is about, I mean, it's it's a corporation, they're corporations, they they have a, a duty to increase their profits year on year. So in 2013, I realized that actually drugs aren't about curing people, they're about treating ill people and we actually need more ill people every year to keep the profits rolling in. I'd had a similar awakening in my national role in the NHS. I got sort of just below government and was working at sort of policy level. And I realized that politics wasn't quite what I thought it was either. Um, and But I, I thought it was just politics and pharmaceutical industry. And then probably about five years later, I, I'd lost my gut health. My intestinal health started to suffer. And I did a lot of primary research on food, the food industry and realized that was the same. You know, a lot of what we're told about what's healthy actually isn't healthy. So I recovered my intestinal health and, and all of my quite a few um, t- whole body conditions or symptoms that I was suffering from all went away uh, just through cleaning my diet out and doing the opposite of what we're being told. So I, so going into 2020, I thought I was aware of, you know, several industries, if you like, that were not quite what, where, you know, most people believe, but I didn't see a bigger picture. Um, and it was, it was not until 2020, late 21, when, uh, I mean, you've mentioned the Red Pill Revolution and the, you know, pl- please have a look on the website, the redpillrevolution.com. And there's a book and I, I got that book and it, opened my eyes to the fact that the whole world, you know, the, the society, if you like, for many hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, has been controlled and is and is a, you know, you could call it an unreality. It's a different version of reality than most people think it is. And so my painful awakening was, if you like, through the lens of COVID, I was very forcefully put up against um, a number of um you know, differences in the, in, in, you know, in the world compared to what I thought really existed. 
And so when so the red pill moment is in, in the film, you know, Neo is offered a red pill and a blue pill. And the blue pill is, um, okay, I'll, I'll just go back to, to my comfortable life and I don't want to know about any of this. So I'll just put my head down and I'll go back to sleep. Uh, whereas the red pill is keep following the truth. And I've always been a truth seeker, you know, right back from my very earliest days. Um, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll disclose to you, to your listeners and to yourself, I, I was adopted um, at two weeks old. Um, I was actually forcibly removed from my mum because my mum was only 15 when, when I was conceived and my father didn't want me, basically. So I was forcibly taken off my mum. And, and so I've, ha- I've had very little trust in authority from a very young age. You, you, you probably, you know, with your professional background, you probably understand the sort of the impact that has on a young baby. I, I was actually fostered, then adopted. So by the time I was four weeks old, I'd had three mothers. Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned to be very self-sufficient from an early age. And I've always questioned authority. I've always sought the truth. And I cannot ignore, you know, inconvenient truths. Um, so my red pill moment absolutely was, well, there isn't a respiratory pandemic going on because less respiratory deaths are happening than normal. Something else is going on, but I don't know what it is. So I I gradually, you know, it's a bit like an onion, you know, you peel a layer off and then there's more layers and there's more layers and you keep going. And I'm still doing that now, sort of, you know, we're nearly four years in now and I'm still peeling layers off. Um, Mm -hmm. And at some point you have to say, well, I've, I've seen enough. I don't want to go any further. Because it doesn't yeah. matter how many layers there are, you know, but, you know, what we were told, what isn't true. Um, so my, my, my quest now is to pursue the truth and to, um, I mean, I'm working in, in an area of, of what I would call true holistic healthcare. So I'm trying to bring the truth to healthcare in a way that it's been denied to most people around the world for a long time. So, Graham, I think... Um what I'm going to ask you to do may be a big ask, but I think it'll be fun. I want you to sort of slap us in the face with the contrast of what you think people see as the truth. You know, the person who's, you know, maybe not aware of the corruption going on, what they think that the government and the politics are doing, mm-hmm. and then compare that to what you've really seen. Yeah. So you, you, I mean, in the UK, we don't have um, advertisements for pharmaceuticals on, on our TV. Uh, but in, in in the US, you do, don't you? Yep. So um, I, I, I can't really understand what that might be like to watch those adverts as a patient or as a member of the public. But, you know, I, w- I would equate it to buying a car or buying laundry detergent. You know, it's just it appears in the middle of a program and somebody saying this is great. And, mm-hmm. you, you of course, you hear all the upside, don't you? And... Then there's like a rushed list at the end, you know, which yeah, is, yeah. you know, it's sped up. Yeah. With the yeah. side effects. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we know, we know that repetition, you know, that repetition is very powerful. You know, if, if, if you repeatedly, you know, hear the same message over and over again, you, you will accept it much more readily. So I, I would presume that most adverts for drugs come on reasonably regularly. So I, I don't know, but it, I, I think it's fairly likely that a lot of people have a, um, or did have a maybe a trusting relationship with healthcare and, and pharmaceuticals and thought these are products that are here to take my headache away, reduce my blood pressure, treat my diabetes, you know, cure my cancer, whatever it is. These are products designed to help me, the individual, with my individual needs. So, yeah, yeah I, I would I would say that, and I, I think a lot of it comes from your relationship with your doctors as well, mm-hmm. you know, because that's really that personal interface. And if the doctor prescribes something for you, then you know you trust your doctor, you like Absolutely. them, they're nice. You might even be going to the same church as them, yes. um, and yeah. and all of these things. And so they're they're someone that you really know in some cases. And so I think, yeah, you you're familiar with it. Maybe you've got a brother or sister or someone you know who works in the pharmaceutical industry because. Mm. they're like the biggest big some of the biggest businesses mm. over here so everyone knows someone in pharma yes. you know maybe everyone yeah. kind of trusts their doctor and, and so i think you get that goodwill you're like you know these aren't evil people you know the, this is this is yeah. very normal and yeah. and i would i'm glad you mentioned that because i you know 
I, I am critical of the system. I'm not necessarily critical of the people in the system. And it, it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a distinction I'd like to make because there are lots of lovely people, you know, well-meaning people who do a great job in the system. And I think a lot of them are probably unaware of the system that they are in. Um, I was one of those people for 30 years. Um, so behind the advert is a corporation. So all pharmaceutical companies are corporations. All corporations have a fiduciary duty to make profits. They, in order for their shares to stay buoyant, they need to make more profit next year than they did this year. So they need more customers. They need more products. Um, so drugs have a patent life. So typically by the time they reach the market, they might have eight to 10 years of branded sales left. And then their, their brand name becomes what we call a generic. And the company who discovered that product and marketed it no longer makes the big money, the big bucks from that product. So they've got a finite window to get their money back from their investment. And it is a very, very expensive investment. Um, most drugs fail. I'm not sure what the percentage of, you know, drugs that, uh, that they try to bring to the market, you know, what, what percentage actually reach the market, but it's probably one or 2%. So most drugs fail quite early on. So that's all lost money. It's all dead money. So they have to make a lot of money back from the ones that do reach the market. So they, they do this by, you know, when a drug reaches the market, they need to convince, first of all, the regulators. So, the FDA and the CDC um, here in the UK, it's it's similar body. So they have to um, convince the national regulators that their product is, first of all, necessary and that it's effective and that it's safe and to some degree cost effective as well. So that's done with evidence from their clinical trial. So they've, they've already done clinical trials in animals and then they've done larger trials in humans. Now, the drug company pay for that clinical trial and they design that clinical trial. So they're already in, you know, in a very strong position to control the outcome. Um, when they've got their clinical trial evidence, the clinical trial is usually presented in a journal, a medical journal or of, you know, of some kind around the world. So New England Journal of Medicine or the British Medical Journal here in the UK. Uh, those journals are largely funded by pharmaceutical um, payments as well. And in fact, the regulators are largely funded by pharmaceutical companies. I think in the UK, our regulator is funded, I think it's about 85% of their income comes from drug companies. So the regulators, so the drug company designed the trial. They wrote the clinical, um, the, the paper. The author of the paper is, um, uh, you know, uh, paid by the drug company. The regulators are paid by the drug company. The paper's then uh, presented at... Um, conferences around the world by professors or heads of departments of universities. They're paid for by the drug company. So doctors get invited to go to these conferences or they might watch it online these days. Um, and what they're watching is an extremely well-crafted advert, you know, maybe not too dissimilar from the advert on the, on the television um, that's completely controlled by the drug company. So well, I'm, I'll disagree with you there because um, I, I, th I think when, when so people see the ad on TV and they go, oh, this is marketing. But when you see it coming from, you know, professor of yeah. Oxford, somehow that doesn't seem like marketing yeah, sometimes, yeah, yeah. you know, because it's like even if you know they assisted in the clinical trial, you know, that the clinical trial for the drug was done at their site. Mm -hmm. I think we have this deference and respect towards professors, especially when they come from leading institutions where we mm. say, this guy must be a clinical expert. He must know things. He must have very noble intentions. And that's the part where I think maybe it's almost scarier in places like the UK where you don't feel like you're getting marketed to, you know, when mm. this is happening, at least in the U S you, you, you know, it's an ad, but yeah. when you're hearing talks or when you're, when you pick up, the Lancet or the BMJ or, or some of these articles where you go, you know, this is peer reviewed, mm -hmm. you know, this is by, you know, leaders in our field, professors, this, surely this isn't marketing, you know. Yeah. I, you make a very good point and I'm glad you picked yeah. me up on that because I, I think you're yeah. right. It's when, when the audience, when the medical clinical audience watches a learned professor or a, a head of cardiology or a, a top psychiatrist, you know, presenting a new wonder drug, everybody pays attention and it's you know it's like at last we've got 
another tool in our toolbox because, you know, we really need this because we've got patients that are struggling and, you know, here's the thing we've been waiting for. And it's very cleverly done. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I spent three years working in the industry, helping them craft those messages. Um, so I, 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 uh, and I was needed or people like me are still needed because the people in the pharmaceutical industry don't necessarily understand the, you know, the needs at the front line or the language that's used and the, you know, the touch points, the, you know, it, you probably call it a universal selling proposition, a USP. You know, so the the the, the doctor in, in the development team in the drug company may think they, you know, that the benefit is in a certain area, but I would say, well, that's great, but nobody's going to buy, nobody's going to pay for that because it doesn't change any metrics at the front line. It doesn't save any money. It doesn't, you know, there's nothing discernible. Yeah. So well, let me ask you this, a, a clarifying question. Hmm. Um, when you went to the drug company, I, I don't know how to say this in a more nuanced way, but I'm going to assume when you were consulting, you were teaching them how to almost game the NHS in a way. You were saying, yeah. this is what they really care about. You know, When you're mm. trying to present to them, these are the metrics that have moved the needle in the past. It yeah. worked with this drug. This is exactly what you should be going for. You should be highlighting this. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that kind of what you're talking about? It's essentially, yes. And, and yeah. so you, it, it's... It's a combination of selling the benefits of the drug um, as from a clinical perspective from the patient. Um, and it may, it may sound a bit harsh, but if, if a new investment, be it a drug or a building or a, you know, an operation, if a new investment doesn't generate um, a saving or a potential saving, how are you going to pay for it? So for people like me in the NHS as a commissioner, when somebody comes along and says, we've got this new new drug, I'd be going, that's great. That's an extra $5 million a year on my, you know, which I don't have because the government have frozen my budget for the last five years. So you need to tell me how I can save $5 million in other costs in order mm. to pay for your drug. So my, my role as a consultant was quite often stitching together the, you know, the money flow. So I would be teaching the marketing executives at the pharma company to say, right, well, your, your method for selling your, your drug needs to hit these touch points because that's going to wake up the payers. You know, we call them payers. So the people who are going to pay for the drug in, inside the NHS. You know, you're going to have to go out and talk to the people who make decisions before the doctors are allowed to prescribe it. And those decision makers care about money. So you've got to convince them first, and then you've got to convince the doctors afterwards. Okay. Yeah. And so thank you for clarifying that. I, mm -hmm. I'm also aware I kind of knocked you off a really interesting train of thought. You were talking about um, all of the ways uh, the influence happens. And so please, please pick up uh, where you left off. So the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. So the, yeah. So the pharmaceutical industry has obviously designed the clinical trial. They, they pay for a lot of the national, you know, the international regulation. They pay for a lot of the pharmaceutical journals. They pay for the lecture tours. Um, and then they, they contribute, but they quite often get involved in at a local level as well. So there's, um, certainly in the UK, um, in the last 20 years, we, the, the laws changed and drug, drug representatives can't turn up in a doctor's, um, office with free pens and can we take you mm -hmm. to golf? You know, here, here's a restaurant meal. You know, they can't do that anymore. But what they can do is, um, say, so, you know, go to the local or the regional uh, health authority and say, right, well, we're prepared to help you pay for some screening, you know, um, you know, cause we're, we're just coming out with a new drug for let's, let's say a heart condition. Um, and we're, we're concerned that there's people out there who will miss out on our new drug. So we will help you fund the screening program so that you'll be able to find the people who will need our drug. And, you know, so the people in, in the health authority say, well, that sounds great because I'm being told by the government I've got to do this screening program anyway. So if you're going to help me fund it, that'll be great. Thank you. Um, we'll take your money. But then, you know, subconsciously, I now, I'm now remembering the name of that drug company and the name of the drug. 
And when it comes to a decision day, you know, in a month's time, when that drug goes to a committee, I'm just going to be subconsciously swayed. And say, oh, yeah, these are nice people. Yeah, these are nice people because they're helping me out. So, yes, let's get their drug on the formulary. Mm-hmm. So it, it works all the way down to local level. And I suppose another thing is once once these screening implements, um, I'm assuming they end up in primary care as well. Yes. Um, um, you know, primary care in, in the UK, I hear it's it's probably pretty quick as well. In the US, a lot of it is owned by private equity and hospital chains and, you know, there's 25-minute visits. But if someone gets one of these screening tools, and probably the most common one for depression is the PHQ-9, which is just uh, nine questions on depression. If you only have 25 minutes and mm-hmm. someone just fills out a questionnaire um, and you've you know, and, and you're aware that there's a, and, and, and maybe you've even seen ads on TV or you've even heard about this new drug from a professor at a recent conference. Now, when that screening implement Mm -hmm. shows up, Oh, you know, this person is high here. Well, we've got a drug for that and it's uh, a quick and easy solution for them. Okay. You've got this problem, which I never would have picked up on before if Mm -hmm. not for the screening implement, Mm -hmm. but Hey, there's a solution. And so it, it, it drives sales. Absolutely. So, and drug companies will, they, they actually collaborate. Um, so in, in where several companies have got competing products in the same clinical field, they will actually work together and they actually have codes of conduct for cooperating together at a national and local level in order to grow, you know, and they call it growing the size of the cake so that mm-hmm. they, that their primary target is to make the cake bigger i.e. more patients. It's not necessarily to take market share off a competitor. So they're mm-hmm. actually working collaboratively together as well, which you know is something I don't think a lot of people would understand. Are you on a journey to taper off psychiatric medications and looking for help? Our practice specializes in designing and overseeing medication tapers. Our services are available for patients living in select states across the US. If you're interested in learning more, just click the link below this video and check out our website to discover more details about our program. You just come here and you click the red button right there. Thanks. It's interesting, you know, because I think, I mean, the term a rising tide floats all boats, you know, comes to mind. And um, I think a lot of the times how this happens is, at least within psychiatry, is they'll find a patient organization that that say it's um it's nami you know national institute of mental illness or or one of these big depression groups and they'll say hey we are with you guys depression is serious it is undertreated and we don't want to lose anyone else to suicide mm-hmm. and because you know, we care about this patient population. We are going to invest in public awareness campaigns mm-hmm. and, you know, lobbying, you know, Kaiser and big healthcare organizations to say, hey, what are you guys doing about screening for depression? And the thing is, you know, screening for mental illness, it's kind of hard to criticize that or, or raising awareness about mental health conditions. I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? Who wouldn't want people to get good help? Mm-hmm. But the problem is that, the help isn't good, you know, because you can have as much screening as you want. But at the end of the day, if the if the help that the person gets isn't good and, you know, they just come in, they get put on a pill and they don't get any holistic care, which could actually, you know, prevent them needing a pill, then it, right. it just grows the market. And so I think you have Pfizer, Eli Lilly, GSK, all donating to groups like NAMI and these big grassroots organizations saying, hey, we're going to fund you guys. Mm-hmm. We're going to send you around the world to talk at conferences and to go to grand rounds and talk about how bad depression is because we really, really want to get the word out. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's how I've seen that type of collaboration happen a lot in the U.S., yeah, and, and certainly in the UK, it's just the same. And, and as you mentioned, um, the, the, the solution isn't always the best solution. So, you know, when, you know, we, um, um, the, the phrase that comes to mind here in the, in the UK is, you know, if you're, if you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm-hmm. Does that resonate Does that yeah. with your audience? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're a clinician with a prescription pad, you know, your, your go to, way of helping anybody is going to be a drug because there isn't mm-hmm. a lot else that's available. And certainly 
in my time in healthcare, a lot of the alternatives to drug therapy have been taken away. So that the, 20 years ago, there used to be, you know, sort of counseling groups in the community, you know, talking therapies, e- even, you know, gardening groups, you know, volunteer, you know, volunteering groups, you know, just to, to help people communicate and, and mix with other people. And, you know, quite often for mild depression, you know, that, that would be all that somebody needed. But those have gone now. Certainly the fund, the national funding through healthcare has gone for things like that. We're only funding drugs and hospitals and doctors writing prescriptions for drugs. And a lot of the alternatives that a practitioner might have had in their toolbox have, have disappeared over the last 20 years, such that they, they reach automatically for the drug. And I think the patients expect them to do that anyway. So it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's a, it's a, it's almost like a perfect symbiotic relationship. Yeah, um, on, on holy alliance, you know. Yeah, or so, that, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, yeah. and the, yeah, it's, and um, I think some people will see, hey, you know, my doctor wants to give me these medications. He wants to prescribe these drugs. That's because they must work. And that's because the other stuff is probably not that useful because otherwise we'd be doing it, right? Mm. Um, and I think that's the the way most people come to see it, but it's really at at the end of the the day, I mean, the reason um, care has become so drug centric is because there's this pervasive influence of money. And I may, um, I'm going to go on a little monologue right now to kind of talk about my, my awakening um, with some of the corruption and what I saw in psychiatry. Um, so psychiatry is definitely one of those areas where there's a lot of holistic uh, interventions that could prevent someone from needing the drug. Um, yeah. And I guess what I saw during my training was that that wasn't even emphasized at all. You know, we simply wrote prescriptions for medications. And I started to think, you know, what what is going on here uh, with the medical education? Because everyone seemed comfortable doing it. And I had that same moment where I was like, well, our professors are all, you know, really talking about mental illness as these biological conditions. You know, we're not really talking about, hey, you know, if someone's depressed because they went through a divorce, just give them a lot of support, see them, see them a bunch, there's a good chance they're going to bounce back. And then, you know, we wouldn't talk about other people like, hey, if this person is depressed because of poverty and economic hardship and severe trauma and maybe an abusive relationship, they might say, this is a much more complicated person to help. You know, we're going to need to pull out all the stops. They may need some drugs. They may need substantial ongoing support. We didn't talk about people like that. We talked about them as either major depressive disorder or not major depressive disorder. And and then we said, well, there's an evidence-based treatment for, for this you know, this symptom based diagnosis and it's just a drug and mm. you know, that that's pretty much it. Yeah. And there was something that was so wrong. Um, there was something so wrong about looking at it in that way that no one, no one was really seeing. And it was when I kind of much like the things you, you explained, I, I kind of dug in, you know, why do we think about it this way? And a lot of the leaders of the academic settings, which train all of the doctors, they are involved with the pharmaceutical company um, uh, through careerism. So there's, you know, when you're when you're a professor or an aspiring professor in psychiatry, you have to publish or perish. I mean, you need to generate uh, publications. Yeah. It is really hard to get grant money from um, the government, but you know where it is really easy to get grant money from pharmaceutical companies, Absolutely. and so. Most of them ran clinical trials yeah. and um, it was really tied to their career progression. And so all, all, all of a sudden, you know, they've got this grant money, they're running studies, they're getting publications. And so they're kind of tied to them. They're, they're not all of a sudden going to disagree with the conclusions on the papers that they've been a part of saying these drugs are safe and effective, you know, they're, they're really wonderful because all of that is tied to their success. Yeah. And so these people ascend their their institutions to the top and then impressionable doctors just like me, and I, I saw them the same way, are just like, you know, this guy's a professor of psychiatry. You don't say, oh, he's just there because he's, you know, mostly involved in drug research because he needed to be there because he's yeah. competitive and he wants to be at the top and all of that. And And we are competitive. I mean, that's 
pretty normal. You don't see it like that. You see it as someone who knows more than you do about the field. And so you're not seeing it as this benign thing. And, yeah. and so I think doctors have been um, misled in a way because they just think that all of these docs that train them who just focus on drugs really are, they, they know more about clinical medicine than, than they do. But the truth, is, the truth is they don't. And those people yes. at the top, they're rarely doing clinical medicine. They might do right. half a day a week and the rest of the time they're just running drug studies. Mm. Um, and I completely agree. I mean, I've, I've spent, yeah. um, I've, I've actually recently um, done a short course studying the history of medicine because I, I, you know, and how doctors came to be doctors, which is, you know, maybe a tangent we, if we've got time we can go into because I think it's mm -hmm. very relevant. But you, you mentioned research and uh, absolutely it's the, probably the, the, the area I didn't elaborate on earlier was the, um, a lot of funding comes into primary care um, and also into hospital secondary care for you know, drug money from pharmaceutical companies for research. And it, it, it's quite an important income stream for both primary and secondary care, but it's also very important to the careers of the doctors doing the research, as you, as you say. Mm -hmm. And the, the studies are designed by the pharmaceutical company. It's, it's not a case that you, you know, you may have an interest in a certain field and you say, well, I'd like to study this. Um, and I'll ask, you know, for some funding. You, you that's not how it works. Basically, all the trials are published or the, all the studies are published and you apply to be part of the study. And it's very tightly controlled. You know, the, the, the methods, the what's in scope, what's out of scope is all very precisely dictated to and the almost certainly the outcomes that are intended to be seen by the drug company you know if, if you don't find those outcomes let's say you may not be successful in your next application for the next study so there's a, there's an inbuilt you know correction if you like in the system that that keeps giving the funding back to the people who find the results that are needed um, oh yeah yeah it's and, a self-reinforcing um, research um, yeah I can T tell you some terrible things about that yeah and mm -hmm. and well the the other comment that comes to mind is that you're not going to be critical of drugs in any kind of public way if um you would like to keep on getting funding and keep on advancing your career um yes. but i i don't know if i told you this graham uh, uh before but i think um um yeah, so I, I worked at the FDA as a drug reviewer. I was aware and of that, I yeah. So, yeah, I so worked in pharmaceutical companies, mm -hmm. and I got to see how they kind of seasoned um, the academic settings to get ready for a drug launch. So, when when you're a drug company and you want to, and and you're going to get a drug onto the market, you you go to all of the big academic centers, the places that are, have the most prestige, and you recruit doctors from there and you say hey how would you like to be a part of telling us you know studying what this new drug does mm. um and then from that group of doctors you know they'll you know they'll get them all familiar with the drug and then they will be able to find people who have more favorable impressions of the drug so you know when they're publishing papers one yeah. doctor might say hey this is a stretch i don't think we should use it for this population you know we don't really like it and another doctor will say you know what I don't really think that's that big of a deal, you know, based mm. on the people I'm seeing, that's pretty safe. Yeah. I wonder who they're going to pick mm. when the conference yeah. comes around, you know, to, yeah. to talk about it. So yeah, they, yeah, it's like a funnel where they can find the people that are most likely to, mm. to say the most favorable things about their drug because they're a business. Absolutely. And, um, mm -hmm. several years ago, um, I came across, um, uh, I was speaking to, um, a, an engineer, and we were contrasting the research that is done in engineering. This is mechanical engineering mm -hmm. uh, versus healthcare. And what I was told about mechanical engineering is that the all of the research goes into disproving the current hypothesis. Because if, if you're building a um, hundred story apartment block or you know office block in downtown New York, you need to know exactly how it mathematically how it is going to stay upright for many, many years. And if you, you need to know if any of your calculations or assumptions are incorrect. So all of the research goes into disproving the current understanding about how buildings or structures stand up. 
Whereas in healthcare, all of the funding goes into um, confirming the current hypothesis. So if you if you want to put funding into um, into healthcare, I mean, I've got a good friend here in the UK who used to work in a university, and his job was um, was attracting research funding, and his particular interest was dementia. So he he um, he wanted to attract funding um, to uh, pro, you know, for treatments or me- methods that would either prevent dementia or at least you know reduce the progression of dementia. Um, and he couldn't find anybody who would invest in those methods. He could only find people drug companies who would invest in we want to treat end stage dementia with drugs. But if you want to find a treatment or a lifestyle choice, you know, even something as simple as a food, you know, and there's there's lots of evidence that, you know, certain types of fatty foods can reduce the progression of dementia. Nobody would pay for invest for, for research in that field. And he actually lost his job with the university because he was so unsuccessful in bringing in research funding to the university. They let, they let him go. Um, yeah i'm i'm having some uh, you know some 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 thoughts so yeah maybe in structural engineering the the dream outcome is the building doesn't fall down you know and 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 maybe you put together the building in the most cost efficient way and it's still structurally sound but for pharmaceutical industry it's drug sales that that's the main outcome which they're trying to optimize for in private equity owned hospitals and clinics, which is very common in, in the U S it's number of patients seen. And yep. so the outcome, and, and I guess why this is confusing is the outcome is, is not really better health. No. Um, you know, people aren't interested yet. Like you said, you know, in people not needing the medications and people not being in pain, mm. uh, you know, long term um, without medications and things like that. It's, 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 those are the motives. And, you know, we talk about uh, matrix, but it really is, you know, like, you know, that uh, the human pod farm, you know, there's this, mm. this scene there where, where Neo realizes that I, I guess the humans have just, you know, they're being farmed for like the heat that they give off in these pods by the machines. Oh, and, and that's what, yeah, they're a battery. Yeah. And I think that's the real maybe red pill moment that people mm. realize that, that I think healthcare has become now mm. is where you realize you know it's not actually about helping you it's it's about kind of just running you through the system um to to generate you know medications and in in primary care settings you know you can have you can have longer visits with your doctors or your psychiatrist where they last 45 minutes but the doctors are incentivized by something called an RVU structure, and then also the insurance reimbursements. They they pay doctors more for fifteen minute visits than they would for a fifteen minute visit and a forty five minute psychotherapy add on. Wow. And so just just with that as well, you're going to get a lot of pressure um, from the clinic owners to say, you know, why are you doing this stuff? You know, just just see them in fifteen minute visits. Otherwise, you're going to be making thirty percent less than your peers. Yeah. Um, and so this, and, and yeah, it's, so, same, it's the same here in the UK. The the incentives are structured in such a way that interactions between clinicians and patients are quick. They can't. Mm-hmm. They haven't got time. The doctor hasn't got time to get into you know the lifestyle alternatives. You know, and give you know maybe some holistic advice about how to you know help the the, the condition in a non pharmaceutical way. So you know the, the doctor reaches for the prescription pad and writes a prescription. I mean, I mean, put put bluntly, there's no money in healthy people, and there's no money in dead people. There is money in people who are unwell. But the, you know, this is this is you know uh, one of these um, unpalatable truths is that probably the pharmaceutical industry worked out decades ago that the way to make the most money is to have products that appear to have a benefit and that's mostly in in reduction of symptoms so if your symptoms go away that doesn't mean your condition is cured but you will probably feel better and your doctor will tell you well you are better and there may even be some algorithm in the doctor's computer system that you know some risk factor calculation that says well actually your chance of a heart attack in the next 10 years has gone down that may be true in the algorithm 
and we we could come back maybe to a clinical trial that's interesting in this area. But so the I think the drug companies have worked out decades ago that if they produce products which alleviate symptoms, take the, some of the discomfort and suffering away in the short term, but actually don't cure a condition, and if possible, actually lead to other conditions. Because then you know uh, when I worked in retail, we used to call it a link sale. You know, so some somebody comes into your you know it's like supersize me. You know, in in the drive through, like an upsell. You know, oh, an upsell. Hey, yeah, exactly. Yeah, hey, yeah. <laughs> we've got this other product that you might yeah. need now. <laughs> so yeah, exactly. So you've you've taken your antipsychotic medication, but now you've got diabetes and you've got high blood pressure and you know you've got a skin rash. So here's three more products. Mm-hmm. I'm going to segue now because I I, I really want to talk about a more kind of personal and human part of all of this. You know, we could talk about examples and different things for a long time, but I want to go into the psychology of people working in the system. And I I want to ask your thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. Why don't clinicians see what's happening? Why is it so few people that recognize what's going on? What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Well, yes, it's unpacking that. I mean, this, I've written a blog on this or several blogs, and it's the same for patients as well. It's but I'll, we'll, we'll, yes. we'll we'll stick with the clinicians. So maybe we can focus on doctors, you know, because yeah. I think I think doctors are pivotal in this. And we you talked a little bit about medical training, mm-hmm. and I think you know from my experience of talking to many many doctors, you know, primary and secondary care doctors over you know several decades. You know, if you ask doctors about their training, they will say, oh, it was just so busy. I never had any free time, you know, and, and you know, the hours the hours were impossible. Um, and I think doctors are deliberately kept extremely busy in med school. I mean, you're, you're all very bright. They select extremely bright people who are able to be um, trained to repeat what they're told and then go out and do it. And it might, and that's not to criticize anybody individually. I just think that's the system. That's how it works. So that when, when doctors come out and, and are practicing, if, if you say to somebody, well, is that true? Or have you looked at the evidence base for that? They'll say, well, I was taught that at med school, or I've looked at the headlines, headline in the study and the headline in the study says that. Yeah. But have you gone to page 15 and looked at this table? No, no, no. I haven't got time. Um, mm-hmm. And that's my experience is they'll read the abstract, you know, the headline and the abstract in the study, but they won't go and look at the data in the, in, you know, in the data table. And there's, there's been many recent examples I've looked at studies where the abstract actually contradicts what's in the data tables later on. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it's made to look like the product is better than it is. But to get that across to a doctor, particularly, I've, I've had zero success over the last 10 years in trying to persuade a doctor that, you know, their understanding of, you know, um, a a disease process or a drug treatment might actually not be correct because yeah, cause, cause it's like, who are you? You know, like, yeah. are you, you know, my, my professor at medical school said this and, you know, yeah. this article, you know, from the BMJ said this, you yeah. know, and honestly, I just don't have the time. So, yeah. um, but I'm I think I kind of do what the rest of my colleagues are doing. That's easier. Exactly. And, and I think yeah. doctors are, they learn very quickly. I mean, I don't know if you had this experience, but I've heard it from many doctors where the, the doctor who tried to stand up, you know, in week one of med school and say, um, can I ask a question, professor, you know, why are we, you know, and, and that person was very quickly put in their place, mm-hmm. you know, and, and made to look stupid. Um, and everybody learns quickly to just keep their mouth shut and behave and do what they're told. Um, so in the system, so this, this plays out in, you know, healthcare, you know, 10, 20 years later when a doctor's working in primary or secondary care, they become routinized to follow, um, treatment protocols. So when a new protocol comes out, a new, you know, insurance, um, you know, the, the, I don't know what you call it in the US, but the, you know, the, the, the 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 rules of engagement, if you like, how how the the, the um, insurance company wants you to practice in a certain area, you you follow it because that's you, you've been routinized to do what you're told, and not question it. And I think so. That's the first level. I think doctors 
the you know the 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 easiest way to continue progressing in the system and and you know and earn more money and be promoted is to do what everybody else does um, and not to challenge it and then if there is an awakening and and that clinician um, says hang on a minute I've now had an epiphany I've had my red pill moment whatever it is and um, they they very quickly realise that they're going to lose their career or at least not get promoted um, if they start to challenge the system. And I, I know many doctors mm. I've spoken to who have, you know, maybe towards the end of their career, they've reached the point where they're extremely cynical. They don't actually believe what they're doing anymore, but they just want to get to their pension day. And they're just working their days out, keeping their head under the counter and, you know, not causing any trouble um, and I've had conversations with doctors and others and, and, and managers and said, Look, can you do this for another? I mean, how old are you? Okay, so you 10 years. Can you do this for another 10 years? Yes, I can. And I'm going, well, I can't. <laughs> you know, my conscience won't let me do that. So I'm going to speak out and look what happened to me. But I know many, many clinicians and managers who've decided to take the blue pill and just mm-hmm. say, I've seen it for what it is. I don't want to see any more. I'm just going to carry on, you know, taking the money, you know, and paying the pension contributions and keeping the school fees paid and the car, you know, and the mortgage. And yeah. it's it's a big tie on a lot of people, isn't it? I'm going to say some crazy shit now um, because you've kind of, you've kind of you've kind of encouraged me. I, I, I'm going to preface it by saying that this. I mean, if you're listening this to this channel already, I'm sure you don't believe this, but if you're new, you know, I think it can be a hard pill to swallow when you say, Hey, my doctor might, you know, my well being may not be the number one priority for my doctor. You know, the truth about medications working and helping me that may not be their number one priority. And so the crazy shit that I'm going to say now is because I'm pretty cynical and I'm interested in history. And when I think about psychiatry, I think about, you know, how can we be harming people? and have a whole profession who's not helping people more holistically, helping them avoid the drugs and all of that. I think about Nazi Germany and I, and I think about a book that I read called Ordinary Men where they were talking about the battalion of people who, um, who were involved in the extermination of the Jews. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they really go into the psychology there and they talk about how re- really at the start, one of the uh, generals there or the commanders or the captain said, you don't have to do this if you don't want to. I have a very gruesome task for you to do and you have to go and, you know, we're going to be executing all of these people. Don't do it. And only a handful of people excuse themselves. And when they, you know, looked over the testimonies of the other soldiers at the time, you know, why didn't you step out? You know, they and they would say things like, I knew it was wrong. I didn't want to do it. They would say things like, uh, I didn't want to be ostracized by my peers. I didn't want to be seen to be weak. I didn't want to be seen to to be a coward. You know, I was, you know, I thought that maybe I, I would have had a career uh, sort of in the military when all of this was over. You know, I was just following orders. You know, they say they say all of these things, which mm. sound really human to me. I mean, they mm. do. They they sound just like working in a corporate environment and the mm. things you do, but. I mean, we were talking about killing women and children mm. and, that, and that's how they rationalized it to mm. themselves. Yeah. And so I sometimes see corollaries with um, what's happening in medicine today mm. with mm. you know, people being aware or just feeling like, hey, I'm not really helping these people. And they just go, well, I don't want to say anything because I don't want my peers to think that I'm criticizing them because that will make things uncomfortable for me. If I start speaking out, they'll start thinking, I think there's something, you know, that they're a bad person. It's going to mess with my career. And so, so, so there's this huge self-interest um, kind of element to the whole thing of just kind of going with the flow and not sticking yeah. out. And yeah. it trumps the truth in it many does. cases and it trumps doing the right thing. It does. Well, I had, I've got so many examples I could give you from my 20 years in, in, Mm -hmm. you know, I I was purchasing hospital services. So whether it would be, you know, spinal injections, you know, steroid injections into the spine or even stenting, cardiac stenting, you know, there's lots of areas where if you actually study the evidence, you will find that the treatment that's being commonly used all around the world now actually has zero benefit and probably has greater harm than benefit. And I have tried on many occasions to talk to the consultants and the hospital and the financial managers in the hospital and say, right, 
there's some evidence here that shows that what you're doing is harmful. I, I am the commissioner. I want to disinvest. You know, I want to reduce the number of those stents that you do or spinal injections. And I want to spend money on primary prevention of heart disease or something like that. And I was literally fought all the way. You know, I, I've, I've actually, you know, had hospitals go to, there's an appeal process in the UK where a hospital can appeal, you know, something like my, my intentions. And in almost every case, I lost at appeal because the system wants to have more activity. It wants to keep having patients flowing through hospitals. And anybody who has an idea to reduce hospital activity will generally end up not being part of the system. You know, they will eventually get managed out because the system wants more and more activity. Um, mm. So, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I've... Um, you know, I mean, even in, um, we, we talked about screening. I mean, uh, atrial fibrillation is a heart condition, you know, that can be screened for. And the evidence is that if you screen a population for atrial fibrillation and you treat the people um, who you think have got atrial fibrillation with drugs, they actually, the outcomes are worse than if you don't screen anybody at all. Yet, mm -hmm. you know, screening for atrial fibrillation is is a national policy directive here in the uk yeah yeah i mean it's i mean i think about the antidepressants i mean pe people hear all the time they could you know these drugs they, they prevent suicide and when you look at the data i mean they cause more suicide attempts than people under age 25 from 25 to 65 they they make no difference at all in the in the rate of suicides. You know that's surprising, and there's only a marginal survival benefit in the groups older than that. But we give we talk about them this blanket term. These drugs save lives, and in fact, if you criticize them, if you criticize the screening or anything like that, you are putting patients at risk, and it just you know flies in the face of what the the the, the, the big studies. I mean, studies conducted by the FDA actually show. It's it's crazy. Mm. Yeah, I, and I've I've had it on many occasions. As I say, I mean, even diabetes treatment, you know, type two diabetes, it's actually quite easy to do holistic lifestyle interventions for you know newly diagnosed type two diabetics and actually reverse their diabetes. You can do that without drugs, very simply. Um, and I, I've I've sat in a committee meeting trying to get this as an agreed policy in my my area here in the UK, and I had the endocrinologist in the hospital arguing against me saying well you know my income will go down i will have less patients coming in i will have less for, you know and even the orthopedic surgeon you know my foot amputations will go down the ophthalmology mm. ophthalmologist saying i will have less eye operations to do and the fi financial manager telling me that i'm going to reduce the income of the hospital and i'm going yes that's a good thing <laughs> and they're, they're all fighting me saying and, and i didn't win my case yeah. To this day, the, the diabetic pathway in my area is still the same as it was. And all these people are having foot amputations, heart attacks, strokes, and losing their eyesight where, you know, and that didn't, doesn't have to be the case. Well, this is a nice segue actually, because, um, we talked about the doctors before. Why don't, why don't you think the, the parent, the, the patients, uh, are aware of what's happening to, uh, to them? I mean, I, have my own ideas about psychiatry, but I, I want to, I want to hear yours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's, again, it's, it's this, we're, we're taught to trust doctors, aren't we? You know, our mm -hmm. parents trusted doctors, our grandparents trusted doctors, you know, doctors are put on a pedestal, you know, in, in society, you know, if there's a, a doctor in town, you know, they are, you know, uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the uppermost people in society you know that's always been the case you know in in you know living memory and um i mean we can maybe go into the history of medicine if you like because i think it's interesting where this all came from but um but i go think for it. let's do it yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah i mean if you go back in history i mean if you go back to hippocrates and galen you know sort of two thousand years ago go back to the greeks you know uh, we didn't have doctors we had physicians Physicians were holistic practitioners that treated the whole patient. And to, to this day, as a pharmacist, I don't understand why medicine, there's, there's, there's mental health medicine and there's physical medicine. 
you know, and what, why, why are the two disconnected, you know, at the earliest point in training for pharmacists and doctors doesn't make sense to me because we're, we are one body, you know, mm-hmm. we are one organism and, and, you know, we could, I'm sure we can talk about the connections with mental health and gut health, you know, and the, you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 the microbiome in the body, you know, it's all, it's all one system, isn't it? So it doesn't make sense to separate it, but 2000 years ago, physicians were holistic practitioners. They, they, they wanted to balance the body's natural energies. And they talked about things that probably most people today would scorn and say, oh, that they're just primitive. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, but, it, but that uh, practice of medicine uh, or, you know, lasted for over a thousand years. And it, it actually wasn't until, um, Sort of um, the war, the the uh, the wars in Europe in in about 1500s, 1600s, where medicine started to change, and it was I think it was actually in France. So um, the French army were losing lots of soldiers because um, we still had physicians and we had surgeons. Surgeons were separate. Surgeons were a separate profession, and the the French were losing too many soldiers on the battlefield, and they weren't turning them around and, and fixing them and sending them back to, to fight. So um, the king decreed that physicians and surgeons would come together and work together as one discipline, and that's where doctors became, you know, profession. And at the same time, um, hospitals were created because hospitables were actually previously hospitables, as in hospitality. And they were run by churches, and they had um, they had a, a side room called an infirmary where the ill people used to sleep. You know, the, the homeless people used to go and seek sanctuary in a church overnight, and the ill people were put in an infirmary. And the the French king had to force the new doctors to work in hospitals because they didn't want to work in hospitals. So, and. Because there was a war on, it was actually the disciplines of surgery that were more important. So returning, you know, sewing people up, mending bones, sending people back to the front line became more important than the the holistic physician uh, skills, the traditional physician skills. And I think that's a pivotal moment where medicine changed. And also at a similar time, we were in the Renaissance and um, the, the new materialistic learnings and scientific disciplines were flourishing. And we had s- scientists of the day were celebrities. So we had the, you know, Pasteur and, and Edward Jenner and the other greats of medicine. And if you actually look at a lot of their, 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 um, experiments, you'll find it's quite easy to find fault with what they did. Yet to this day, they are taught, you know, on, Doctors are taught that they are, you know, the founding fathers of modern medicine. So I think what was lost was a, a holistic view of a human, you know, a whole being, with an idea of um, restoring balance and going back to wellness. And what was repla- what replaced it was was the discipline of this, this materialistic reductionist approach. So we get into specialisms, you know. You know, you're you're a an orthopedic surgeon. You don't do heart problems. You don't do respiratory problems, and then you get subspecialism. So the orthopedic surgeons only do knees or ankles. They don't do shoulders. So t- you know, now in modern medicine, we've got if you go into a hospital, you've got all these doctors who are subspecialists. But can you find one doctor in the hospital who will treat me as a whole person? You, and you'd struggle unless you're a child or a, a very elderly person, because we still have pediatricians and geriatricians. But in the middle, for everybody else, you know, if you've got five things wrong with you, you'll probably need five appointments with five different specialists. Mm-hmm. So I think all of that's relevant um, to why patients today, because uh, these people are gods. You know, you know, my, I've had the experience in my own family, um, my, um, my, my, my own parents and my in-laws, my parents-in-law have all in the last 10 years um, used an awful lot of healthcare services. And much of what they've gone and had done to them, I've, you know, been pulling my hair out because I know what's really behind it. But could I persuade them? <laughs> Not a chance, you know, because, you know, they've in 70 years of their 80 years of living, they've come to believe very strongly in the lure of allopathic medicine. 
And it, you know, undoing that learning, you know, is not something that's going to happen quickly. It may, it may take a red pill moment. I mean, the patients who do walk away are usually ones who are almost dead, who, you know, they've, they've, they've survived, you know, miraculously, you know, uh, drug treatments. And I'm sure you've got, I know you've got many, many case studies on, on, you know, on your own site of people like this who've had their own very painful awakening, uh, an experience of something not being quite what they thought it was. Mm-hmm. But to explain that, I mean, again, we could go back to the matrix, you know, because um, Morpheus says to Neo, um, I can't tell you what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. Yeah, I that's spot on. I mean, the main reason I think that people wake up to it is because they have to. Something happens to them, they get hurt and they go and look for questions and they don't get better. In fact, they get made worse and then they're, they're thrust on this journey that they wish they never had to go on. Yeah. And that's, and, and, and that's it. But, but otherwise, I mean, if, if, if things don't get that bad, I, I think a lot of the times people, they just, they don't want to think about it too much. I've got this problem. Yeah. My labs are out of order. The doctor says this solved. Yeah. Um, and let me just carry on with my life um um nothing i can tell them about statins will uh you know change change their mind if they're yeah. if they're you know you know if their doctor said hey well you know this is going to prevent a heart attack um i don't know about that um <laughs> so but yeah so great what haven't we covered yet? What what are you what are you what are you aching to share? I feel like we've we've really kind of talked about quite a lot. What do you, yeah yeah what what have we missed so far? Um, I, I suppose we could talk about you know what happens next because I th- I think you know I mean we're talking about patients slowly realizing what's real and I think the same is happening with clinicians. So you know I, I've positioned myself outside the system. I you know I've 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 got a presence. Uh, social media presence as the red pill pharmacist. And what, what I'm moving into now with some colleagues is um, a project where we're, we're, we're seeking to be a safe place where people can come and have a conversation about what's really going on and what the alternative might be. You know, so true holistic, you know, um, restorative healthcare, uh, however you want to describe it. And I think there's, you know, the, the there's a lot of great stuff in Western medicine, you know, particularly on the emergency side. You know, the the you know, I'm not here trying to criticize everything that's in Western medicine. I think you know, if you're in an acute crisis and you need an emergency room, if you need fixing, whether that's physically or mentally, you know, Western healthcare is is you know very good by and large at at responding urgently. What it's not very good at at all is the chronic stuff, the long term stuff. Mm-hmm. And restoring people to ha- to wellness. So, um, w- my passion now is to create a space where we can have this open discussion about, well, okay, what really works? What is the evidence? Let's leave all the egos at the door. Let's leave the name calling at the door, because mm-hmm. we're going to put hard data on the table and we're going to be honest about what it tells us about the nature of human healthcare and human health. Um, and I think there's an awful lot we don't know. I think there's a lot that probably was known, you know, hundreds of years ago. I mean, we, I think af- after the, the sort of Renaissance period, I think the next pivotal time was the sort of the Flexner Report, 1910 to 12, 13 in the US. You, you familiar with the Flexner Report? No. no. Okay. So, so, um, 19, 1900, 1905 in the US and Canada, around the Western world, there were lots of medical schools. So you, you could learn osteopathy, you could learn um, chiropractic, you, you could learn, uh, you know, uh, botan- uh, plant medicine, um, homeopathy even. So universities, medical schools taught lots of different medical disciplines. Um, now, the American Medical Association in 1910 commissioned a review of medical training and it was funded by John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. And they secured the services um, of a chap called Abraham Flexner and he wrote the Flexner Report. And what the Flexner Report um, recommended was that 
uh, funding for medical schools from the American Medical Association, and it became Canadian and, and ultimately all around the Western world, funding should be directed to those medical schools and universities that would teach allopathic medicine. And all of the forms of medicine were to be, I mean, today's word that's used is quackery. Mm -hmm. So if you're a homeopath or a plant doc or you do chiropractic, you know, your average medical doctor, I'll probably doctor will say, well, those are just quacks. You know, they're, that, that's a pejorative term. So the funding um, was, was steered into allopathy and allopathy is basically treating, so diagnosing a condition. So lots of new diagnoses were created and the diagnosis the, the results in a drug treatment. Now, John D. Rockefeller owned Standard Oil. He's the biggest, richest oil magnet in, in the world at the time. And um, most pharmaceuticals are made from oil. Mm. So the, the, uh, the connection is there that they, they basically created a, a, a doctrine, a, mis, a, a discipline of medicine that created endless diagnoses and the treatment is usually a pharmaceutical drug, which is made from oil. So, you know, I, I, I often describe this as that, you know, if you're refining oil, you can sell the, the you know, the, the gas, you know, and the, uh, you know, the aviation fuel, but you're going to be left with the sludge in the bottom, you know, that you can't sell, but you can make drugs out of that and sell it for a lot more money than you can sell the gas. So. Wow. This all came into being, so the Flexion Report is, you know, I'm not sure how many doctors actually know about this, but if you go back to prior to the Flexion Report, there were there was a flourishing, um, you know, lots of diff, dis, different disciplines of medicine flourished, but they were basically all consigned to the edge of society and treated with disdain. So, I mean, here in the UK, if you, if you try and use homeopathic medicine or suggest that somebody goes and has some herbal tea, you know, you'll get run out of the hospital. You know, <laughs> you won't survive. Um, but, I, but I think a lot of these, you know, other modalities of treatment have a place. You know, there's a lot of learning. And, and if you go back even further, if you go back into tribal medicine, if you go to the, you know, the indigenous Americans or the Aborigines in, in Australia or the, the tribes in Africa, and you talk to their medicine men or women about how they heal people, they actually do an amazing job and they don't use drugs. You know, they might use some plants, but they won't use pharmaceutical drugs. And so I, I, I can envisage, you know, I mean, the, the, the silver lining in the whole COVID dark cloud era is that a lot of people have woken up to the yes the, to, to the um inadequacies of modern medicine and you know the, the so i you know i think my focus now is to is to help create you know a, a, a safe place where we can talk as human beings you know and you as a doctor me as a pharmacist the nurse the cleaner you know <laughs> The guy who you know who um, grows food, you know the you know the the the, the um, you know the farmer or whatever, you know we can all join together and have an honest discussion about what it takes to make a well human and restore that's, wellness. That's great. So, so Graham, tell my audience where where can they find you? Mm -hmm. So, um, if if you type in um, the redpillrevolution dot com. So at the minute, there's a Red Pill Revolution website, and I have a presence on that website. We're just about to create a, my own website. Hopefully, that will come online in the new year. Um, you can find me on Twitter as the Red Pill Pharmacist, or just search Graham Atkinson. Um, I don't tend to use Facebook, um, so ma mainly Twitter. Um, so I, I, you'll find a number of videos and blogs that I've uh, written. I'm currently writing a book. Um, which I hope will be out middle of next year. And that essentially what we've talked about today is the, is the content of my book, which is how did we get here? What, where are we actually now? What can we just be honest about where we actually are and where are we going to go next? Um, let me know when it's out. I'll, um, I will. I'll, uh, let, let my audience know. Yeah. Thank you. So, so Graham, we've covered so much today. I 
love talking to people who have been in pharma and also have been in uh, drug regulation. And so it has been a pleasure getting your insights. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you, Dr. Joseph. And uh, you know, thank you to all your listeners and viewers. Yeah.